Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. We talk about Blu-rays here. We also talk about 4Ks, and that's what we're talking about today. We are talking about a reissue of a movie, now in 4K, from the Criterion Collection. And that movie would be Nicholas Rogue's Walkabout from 1971. And this film goes back a while with me because... It was part of a large cachet of films that I discovered via the books of Danny Perry, which I've talked about a lot here, but I always like to bring it back to Danny Perry when it's specifically a movie that I know that I wouldn't have come across for some time without having his books to guide me. And in this case, uh, it's included in his book, Cult Movies 3. It's also in Guide for the Film Fanatic. I'll read from this in a little bit so you can get a sense of what he had to say about it. But it is a really remarkable film. Uh, For those that don't know, it's sort of like an adventure survival film, I guess. Um, It's directed by Rogue, starring Jenny Agutter in an early role for her, although, you know, not her first role by any means. Uh, His son, Luke Rogue, uh, they play brother and sister in the film, and uh, an Aboriginal actor named David Gulpilil, Gulpilil, who would go on to play a lot of roles in a lot of movies, and I'll talk about that either, uh, that also. Uh, It is based on a 1959 novel by James Vance Marshall, a script by Edward Bond. It's loosely based on the novel. Um, It's set in the Australian outback, and it centers on two um, white school children who are left to fend for themselves in the outback, uh, and they come across and teenage or aboriginal boy who helps them out in terms of surviving he's on his own walkabout which is in terms of the aboriginal uh people it's this idea that when you turn 16 or a certain age you have to go off for months to survive uh on your own living off the land the fruits and the animals of the land and you know show that you can do it um so he's in the midst of that and wandering around and runs into them and i won't go into the specifics about how they end up in this little bind, if you will, their their dad is part of it, and it's a fascinating beginning to a movie. I can't say that I've, I can't say that I've seen too many movies like it ever, to be honest. I mean, you know, you can you can talk about things like Koyana Scotsy, or um, you know, on some level, I don't know why I think of two thousand one. I mean, they're just there's they're just these transcendent visual films. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's really a unique film and the the way it begins is certainly very unique. Uh, it is Rogue's second feature film. Uh, performance was his first, although this was a feature that he was developing before he was, uh, making performance before he ended up co-directing that with Donald Kamel. Um, and it was sort of part of the Australian new wave movement uh, it's, you know, is part of a group of films like Wake and Fright, uh, The Last Wave, Long Weekend, I mean, I guess Mad Max, uh, Picnic at Hanging Rock, you know, there, there's a lot of really interesting, uh, Australian, My Brilliant Career, um, interesting, um, Australian films, The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, that, were part of this movement, and, uh, yeah, this is just a really beautiful film, and I guess it was one of two films, along with Wake and Fright, Australian films entered in the competition for the Grand Prix du Festival at the 1971 Cannes Film Festival. And um, anyway, uh, so so Jenny Agutter, when she makes this film, is 16 years old, and Luke Rogue was like six or seven years old. Um, and I find that fascinating. You don't see a lot of films made in this way. Like, it's the farthest thing from a big studio film that you can imagine in a lot of ways, because there's not a lot of dialogue. Uh, When the, you know, two kids run into the Aboriginal boy, they can't really communicate at first, although the boy and the young kids start to being, start being able to communicate. But, you know, so there's not a ton of dialogue. It's very, um, just tons of shots of them wandering through the beauty of the outback and it, or Sydney, 
Australia, and and it's just a gorgeous film. It's got a gorgeous um, John Barry score that kicks in a little bit later in the movie, but it is you know a delightful and dark tale of uh, loss of innocence, sort of of uh, finding makeshift families in strange places. Um, there's also a fair amount of animal death depicted. If you're sensitive to that, like I am, you may want to be aware of that. Uh, but it is, it is truly a beautiful film and I can see why, you know, it's been with the Criterion Collection for a long time. Uh, it's been with the Criterion Collection since Laserdiscs. The audio commentary that's included here is originally from the 1996, I believe, Laserdisc release of the film, and it includes Nick Rogue and Jenny Agutter. Actually, a really, really great commentary track, and so no reason to update that. Obviously, Nick Rogue not being with us, you can't update it, but um, but that said, it is truly uh, a -a one-of-a-kind film. Uh, Let me just... So Danny Perry's book, uh, I'll just read a little bit of it here just to give you a sense of what I read that first turned me on to this movie. He says, before turning to directing, Nicholas Rogue was the celebrated cinematographer of such films as Roger Corman's Mask of the Red Death, 1964, Francois Truffaut's Fahrenheit 451, 1967, John Schlesinger's Far From the Madding Crowd, 1967, and Richard Lester's A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, 1966, and Petulia, 1968. There's a movie I really, really want on Blu-ray, by the way, uh, Richard Lester's Petulia. I hope somebody picks that up at some point, uh, which used the fragmentary narrative style that would later characterize his own films. That's Petulia he's talking about. Um, for his directorial debut, Rogue wanted to make Walkabout based on the James Vance Marshall's popular novel about a white girl and her younger brother who, while lost in the Australian outback, meet an aboriginal boy who leads them to safety. In the winter of 1973-74 issue of Sight and Sound, Rogue told Penelope Houston and Tom Milne why he was attracted to the book. Quote, It wasn't the visual side of the book at all. Uh, it was that here were two people, two people in effect since the little boy acts as a chorus to the the Aborigine and the girl, who by this curious moment of fate were at a point where they could have been in love with each other. They had everything to offer each other, but they couldn't communicate and went zooming to their own destinies through odd placement of identity, the identity other people had put on them. I love that quote. Uh, It says, Rogue interested National General in distributing... uh, an adaptation of the book and convinced fellow Englishman playwright Edward Bond, who had never been to Australia, much less the Outback, to write it. After scouting uh, locations for eight weeks, Rogue returned to find that in lieu of a script, Bond had written 14 pages of handwritten notes. They were exactly what I wanted. I never wanted to be it to be anything but a play. I wanted it to be like our town, but with Australia as the setting. But while we were... Talking, I was thinking, I've got to present this as a first draft to National General. 14 sheets of airmail paper. Eventually, Bond wrote a 63-page script, an extraordinary piece. It had no scenic detail, nothing. It was it was a play. But National General rejected it, and the project collapsed. Rogue went on to co-direct with David Kamel the controversial performance, 1970. It, too, was about a character entering a strange environment, a collision of opposites, cultures, and a result of... And as a result, self-realization. Rogue would deal with similar themes in 1974's Don't Look Now, 1980's Bad Timing, and 1985's Insignificance and Eureka, finished in 1981 but not released until 1985. Um, And then he goes on to talk about how the film eventually was made. But just to be clear about how it was the first movie he wanted to make. And in fact, as much as it's not his first film, it is his first solo directing credit. And... It really is one that establishes him as a filmmaker for the ages. You know, somebody to be recognized and to be remembered for sure. You know, it's it's just that good of a movie. Um, So anyway, I really, really love this film and was very excited to see, you know, it get its Blu-ray release. And then uh, I think Second Sight did another Blu-ray release. and now we get this 4K, which looks very, very nice. And I'm very happy to see it look as good as I've ever seen it look. 
Um, I'm curious if they talk about new 4K digital master with uncompressed monaural soundtrack. Um, one 4K UHD disc of the film presented in Dolby Vision HDR and one Blu-ray with the film and special features. Yeah, so um, it looks it looks very nice. If you're a fan of the film, you will not be disappointed in this new visual presentation. Unfortunately, I don't think they've added any new extras. I will um, go through those in a moment. First, I want to mention, and sometimes I forget these, and I don't like that I do that, but uh, this includes an essay by... Uh, author Paul Ryan, which I think was included in the the, the the Blu-ray release as well. As you can see, we have the 4K UHD and the Blu-ray included here. Unusual double spindle from Criterion. Um, let's see. Some years ago, I screened Nicholas Rogue's 1973 film, Don't Look Now, for a group of international students who were learning English. This is, of course, the Ryan uh, essay, the beginning. We discussed the film afterward, and I was delighted to discover that despite their limited understanding of the language, these young people had not only grasped the essentials of the fragmented narrative, but also picked up most of the nuances of the story. Of course, it should come as no sur real surprise that Rogue, who first distinguished himself as a cinematographer, would be able to convey a story in visual terms, but it was that audience's response to the subtleties of the characters and emotions that uh, most underlined his achievement. The central scene of love ma lovemaking prompted the first hesitant remark, it was beautiful when they try to make a new baby. Uh, it was obvious that these were not passive spectators. Where some would have seen a thriller, they had observed a tragedy. Don't Look Now should be proof enough that more than any other British filmmaker of his generation, Rogue has the ability to create pure cinema. But the finest example of his gifts remains Walkabout 1971, his first solo outing as a director. He had co-directed and photographed performance, but is generally accepted that while the look and the pace of that film owe much to Rogue, its authorship, in quotes, can be more properly ascribed to its screenwriter, Rogue's co-director, Donald Kamel. Uh, Walkabout is entirely Rogue's own, based on the novel... Uh, the Children by James Vance Marshall. Um, Walkabout is, like its source material, essentially a coming-of-age story. In Marshall's novel, the two white children are survivors of a plane crash, and the core of the tale is their journey through the Australian outback and relationship with an aboriginal boy who befriends them, as in the film. The book has long been regarded in Australia as a children's classic along the lines of the Swiss family Robinson, but Rogue and his screenwriter Edward Bond made a small, significant small significant changes that took the film into harsher territory. Uh, the first of these was to eliminate the plane crash. Um, they uh, initially perhaps to avoid similarities to the opening of Peter Brooks's 1963 adaptation of William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies. Uh, I'm not going to say what they replaced it with because if you haven't seen the movie, uh, I think it's a really jarring opening and very memorable. Um, thus heightening the violence of the opening and personalizing the children's abandonment. Also heightened was the children's curiosity about about one another, which took a deeper element of sensuality and in the case of the girl and the aboriginal boy, nascent sexuality. In a justly famous scene, the girl swims naked in a lake, and while this can be interpreted as her need to clean and refresh herself mid-journey, it has an unmistakable element of display. Toward the film's end, it's... Uh, it is the turn of the aboriginal youth to display by means of a sexually charged ritual dance directed at the girl. Uh, okay, I'm not going to go too much further because it's starting to get into plot stuff, and there's not much plot in the movie. But um, a great essay, uh, definitely worth a read, and I'm so glad they included that. But like I said, um, this has the features of the previous releases, so you get the audio commentary with Nick Rogue and Jenny Agutter from 1996, and it's just a really remarkable track. You know, it's edited together. You'll hear Nick Rogue, then you'll hear Agater, and then back and forth and so forth. And I just love hearing Nick Rogue talk about his vision and his style and <clears throat> how he approaches filmmaking because I do think he is truly somebody that stands out uh, and has stood out over time as, as a really unique voice. And that fragmented storytelling, you do get to see the beginnings of it here. He will go much deeper 
in some of his later films, like Don't Look Now, um, but you see the beginnings of it here. You see jump cuts, you see freeze frames, you see dissolves and freeze frame dissolves. You see all kinds of interesting things amidst a plethora of beautifully composed shots of this Australian landscape that almost seems otherworldly at times and is just truly captivating. And the film itself becomes kind of mesmerizing as you watch. Um, yeah, and, and David Gulfpool, Gulfpool is fantastic in this, as are both Luke Rogue and Jenny Agutter. They are basically the main cast of the film. You know, there are some other people we see towards the beginning and then some more towards the end, but ultimately it's just them and the landscape and animals and it's just so beautifully observed. Uh, it, it's so great to see it look so nice. Anyway, uh, I love this commentary. It's truly one of the better commentaries that Criterion has produced. So definitely check that out. Uh, this also includes a 20-minute interview with Jenny Agutter that was recorded in 2008. And she talks about first hearing about the film when she was 14 and meeting Rogue and then being cast later. Um, and also what it was like to work with Rogue in general, and also David Gulpolo. Um, in the commentary, she mentions something interesting about when she was 14, because she's 16 when she makes it, but she meets him when she's 14, and how it was originally set up to maybe be produced by Apple, the Beatles company, and for her as a 14-year-old girl at that time, the late 60s, there was nothing more uh, enticing than the idea of maybe possibly getting to meet the Beatles through this feature. Maybe that was more enticing than even doing the movie. Um, so I thought that was an interesting little detail that she added in the commentary. Uh, but a very great interview with her, a wonderful actor that uh, I'm a big fan of in general. Many folks we may, may know her best from American Werewolf in London, but she's done a ton of movies and she's great. Uh, there's also an interview with Luke Rogue that's 21 minutes. Now this one the interview with Agatha, I think, was done for another DVD or Blu-ray release. Um, but this one is exclusive for the Criterion in 2010. I think it came with the Blu-ray when it was initially released. So I think we're 13 years on from that Blu-ray, maybe? I don't know if that... I guess that could be possible. Um, and it's recorded in London. And he discusses the shooting of Walkabout and his father's work in general. I do find it interesting that he talks about his father... And he calls him Nick, uh, which is is cute to me. <laughs> um, but he, he talks about the iconic nature of Walkabout and how it, you know, just the the part of the reason it's iconic is the way that it it portrays the Australian landscape and how beautiful it, it is. Like few films, certainly few films before it had captured it, and I would dare say maybe few since have captured it in quite the same way because so much of it is just about the landscape it's really it's just such an interesting artful film um but he talks about how you know he would go on to do it again in don't look now with venice venice is another sort of iconic location that's used memorably by rogue in that film so i thought that was fascinating but he goes into lots of detail about his memories of the film, and there's lots of neat black, uh, sorry, color stills from behind the scenes stuff from the movie um, that are really neat to see. Just tons of shots that are interspersed throughout that interview. So that's a really neat interview. Um, and then we have this really neat full documentary um, by Darlene Johnson called Gopalil One Red Blood. And this documentary looks at the extraordinary life of David Gulpilil and how he continued his acting career while remaining strongly rooted in his Aboriginal community. Um, he would go on to be in The Last Wave. I, I think I mentioned that as part of the Australian New Wave, but um, but yeah, he, he only recently passed away in November of 2021. But he was in tons of movies. He's in... The Right Stuff, Until the End of the World, The Proposition, Mad Dog Morgan, um, The Dark Age. Uh, there's even another documentary called My Name's Gopalil that he's in. Um, One, Red, uh, One Red Blood is 56 minutes, so it's not quite a full feature-length doc, but it is, um, it is a great portrait of the man, and he is 
pretty memorable. Like you see his face and you remember him from these other films that you've seen him in crocodile Dundee. If you're a kid from the Midwest like me and that's probably the first time you saw him. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, he's a great actor and, you know, just an incredible presence. So it's nice to see him honored with this, um, you know, wonderful documentary also included. So, so yeah, this is a really delightful release of a very important cult film, but a very important, you know, cinematic, you know, achievement, just a movie that people remember. And it's kind of like the kind of film that I always think of when I think of the Criterion Collection, what the Criterion Collection is about to me, just these really remarkable, unique, uh, influential films. And Walkabout is definitely that, in my opinion. So anyway, this is well worth your time, well worth picking up. You may have the Blu-ray, but being that this film is such a visual film and a visual feast, I have to say it's hard not to want to own it in this new 4K UHD format. Uh, I think it's worth picking up. So anyway, I just want to say thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you soon. We'll talk about some more Blu-rays. Okay, bye-bye.